21st century is definitely the century for quantum technology and quantum engineering. It's important to recognize that there are three pillars of quantum technologies which are common to the marketplace right now. One is quantum computing, the second one is quantum sensing, and then there's quantum communications. We all know what computers are and, we, and the physicists call it classical because it's based on the laws of classical physics. Things that are above atomic size, things that we're generally used to. And what has happened is computers are getting smaller and smaller, microelectronics are getting smaller and smaller to the uh, point that they're now in nanometers, below nanometers, full quantum effects like subatomic type effects happen. And so you either try to fight those effects or you try to use those true quantum effects to create a new type of computational framework and that's basically what quantum computing is. Quantum computing is a type of computing that leverages some principles of quantum mechanics. Two in particular are entanglement and superposition of states. Superposition of states has to do with the fact that in classical computers, you have a bit to store information, which is either a zero or a one. In quantum computers, you can have some combination of zero and one. Superposition, in a sense, means that several states of a physical system can exist simultaneously with certain probabilities to create very interesting algorithms that cannot exist in the standard computational framework. The quantum computing example of superposition is that it's a zero and one at the same time until it's observed and then it's either zero or one. So it's a superposition of zero and one, splitting that superposition and reassembling it, not observing it, because if you observe it, you break it. A qubit can store something that is 20% zero and 80% one, or anything along that spectrum. Entanglement has to do with combining two qubits together in a particular way. Influencing one qubit automatically influences the other qubit, no matter how far away the other qubit is. People typically talk about entanglement as two particles which cannot be described independently, they can only be described in their entangled state as the pair. So this entanglement allows you to manipulate these qubits in a very interesting way and get some results that we can't get as fast with classical computers. There are some things that quantum computers can't do nearly as well as classical computers, but there are some things that quantum computers do it much better, particularly finding sort of needle in a haystack type problems. Quantum sensing, although people don't realize it, is here today as a quantum technology, whereas quantum computing is a beautiful vision of the future. We all use GPS on our phones and everywhere else. Uh, a lot of that is guided by atomic clocks and atomic clocks at their most basic level are a quantum device. There are also many types of sensors which use atoms, so the same thing that makes atoms difficult to use for quantum applications like what we do actually makes them perfect for sensing. Applications exist now for people trying to do different types of navigational techniques by mapping the world via magnetic field because they now have the ability to do that. Quantum communications also is something that I don't think people realized has been with us at least since the mid-00s. The idea is that instead of communicating with the normal pulses of light, which we use in optical fibers today, which are encrypted to be information via mathematical algorithms, that instead you use single particles of light and you physically encrypt information into each one of those single particles of light. So I would be sending a string of single particles of light to you, and each one of those particles of light would be a bit of information. You could think of what QNECT does as a second generation technology. So instead of using single photons for communication, we're using entangled pairs of photons. The property of entanglement is the property which actually provides a type of security because the moment that somebody observes the pair, or either half of the pair, you damage the entanglement, you break it, which makes 
the pair very sensitive to eavesdroppers, and that's the basis of, of secure quantum communications with entangled pairs. The sensitivity comes down to a basic bit of information, you know, is set as a zero or a one, and, you know, those can suddenly flip when you don't want them to flip. And so you want to have your set of zeros and ones and that combination of binary code to be very stable. And if they're already suddenly flipping, you know, the whole thing becomes random. And so different hardwares have different sensitivities. And uh, quantum systems currently are either room temperature quantum systems, which are photonic largely, or millikelvin temperature, which need, you know, very expensive refrigerators. I think the the biggest challenge of quantum communications and quantum networking in general has been learning how to create high quality entangled pairs and then distribute them through fiber while preserving their properties. It's like the very most basic thing. Learning how to do it in a fielded context compared to the laboratory safe environment where you have fiber spools is hard. I think one of the, the forgotten pieces of the quantum tech ecosystem is this idea of how are people going to use quantum in their daily lives. I often say, at least with the cybersecurity aspect, it's working when you don't know about it. So the point of cybersecurity is for it to be so good that it sits on top of the existing system and simply provides another layer that keeps our economic security intact or privacy, et cetera. If somebody asks you what the, inter the digital internet was going to bring to you in the 1970s, the answer would have been a whole bunch of scientists talking on copper wire, exchanging data. We can exchange our data to each other. No one would have thought e-commerce. No one would have thought computer viruses. <laughs> no one would have thought of all of the things which had followed because until the internet became a place where you could have easy transactional space, it wasn't clear what the downstream applications were going to be. I think the quantum internet has the same potential that it's very hard to say, this is the killer app that we'll be looking at 20 years from now. The very near-term app is this increased security. And that means that you have a potential to have very safe financial transactions. We know that this is under threat. We all see the headlines that come out every day of some other data breach, right? The idea of having much more secure financial transactions for economic security is good for the world. It's not simply good for national security. So if there's a type of problem that requires lots of combinations of for example, lots of different configurations of molecules for drugs, for instance. And we have to search through billions of different possible combinations to look for that one that will give us the solution that we need. Quantum computers are usually good at that type of problem. Wall Street became mathematically technical in the late 90s, sort of financial engineering, quantitative finance, things like that. And they uh, hired many physicists and mathematicians at the time. They actually do use quantum computing and quantum machine learning. Wall Street is all about size and speed. The faster you can do things and the more you can do. All sorts of transactions happen because we are capable of encrypting things with a key. The key needs to be protected. That's of the utmost interest to security. And it doesn't need to be changed so often that you need to be doing it at the same data rate that you're streaming your cat videos. If I have a pair of photons and I I, it encodes some information and I keep one and I send one to you. As long as they're entangled, we know they're safe. In the case that an eavesdropper has intercepted yours on the way to you, then it should have changed the property and I should be able to detect that. And this has led to people talking about quantum communications as a hack-proof system. It is not hack-proof, it is just simply very, very sensitive to hacking. Quantum computers are gonna cut through encryption like a hot knife through butter because they are able to find keys that unlock locked files 
much quicker than classical computers. In fact, that's why encryption works, is that if you were to try to break encryption with a classical computer, it would take way too long to do it. It's just not worth trying. Well, quantum computers for that task work so much better, suddenly it is worth trying, and it's completely feasible to break a code in a reasonable amount of time. Once quantum computers become prevalent, is we're, we're gonna have to come up with a new way of encoding files because the current way is just not gonna be good enough. So we really are at an inflection point. Students can use their existing expertise in math, computer science, physics, electrical engineering, and with a little bit of sort of supplemental education in these areas could really become appealing to potential employers. These employers are, are hungry for quantum proficient students. There's no existing pipeline, very few in universities at the moment, that will get students educated in this, in this area. So you can pick and choose one course here and one course there, but there are very few programs that if you just follow them will take you through the steps that you need to get to in order to become somebody that is appealing to companies that are looking for hires that are proficient in this area. One of the great things about interdisciplinary science is there's no one way to get into it. You can build your background from a lot of directions. Computer science is really natural uh, for being able to interface with all of the software that needs to be built to drive instruments like ours. So you can have a standard software developer type background and still be working in a quantum company because quantum instruments need to be controlled by something. Engineering is very important because everything we build is a piece of hardware. It has electronics in it, it has mechanical things that need to be designed. Optomechanical engineering, so the engineering side of building these very sophisticated optical setups, is a skill set that is valuable to every photonic space company. What's fascinating about learning about quantum computing is that the technology is being developed, but the applications that we have for the technology once it's developed are actually being developed faster. So there's this bizarre situation where we have this queue of all these algorithms that were ready to run on these devices should they be created one day. So there's these sort of parallel tracks that coexist and it's really fascinating that we are educating people on how to program on quantum computers before the quantum computers exist. I mean, they exist and they're becoming more and more complicated, but the ones that, that exist right now are still relatively primitive. But it's exciting to think that we are training people to use things that don't yet exist.